Hey guys, welcome to the second channel. I'm here with two very special guests, both of whom you've probably seen their work before. First is Lance Oppenheim, who directed Some Kind of Heaven. We interviewed him a few years ago on the Cars cast, but he's got two new projects out right now, one of which is Renfair, and the other is Sperm World. And I'm also joined by Daniel Garber, who recently, I have to bring it up, won Best Editing at the Independent Spirit Awards. Congratulations, Dan. Thank you. Um, huge uh he edited how to blow up a pipeline cam some kind of heaven and sperm world and yeah i'm i'm pleased to have you guys here thanks for being here thanks yeah. for having us yeah, yeah thank you always good um, to see you. lance is there anything do you want to introduce the film say a little bit about what the film is about uh i feel like you would do a better job kind of summarizing it than i would <laughs> yeah no I, i've i've uh I, I better get good at this but it's it's a movie about people who meet on these unregulated online forums for sperm and mm -hmm. you know that's sort of the worlds of the film but the stories are kind of vary and they're all very different from one another uh and in a way it's almost more like a mystical road movie or something like that it deals with a lot of existential feelings and thoughts and life's mysteries um as people hand or inject or absorb uh sperm so it's uh you know there's a lot going on yeah i wanted to start by saying you capture your subjects in these extremely vulnerable and intimate states but you're also getting these really beautiful shots i'm wondering especially in this one i feel like there's so many setups where I'm like the camera is in is so close to the subject and is so perfectly framed and then you get them to say like something so crucial to the film I'm wondering yeah how much of it was planned if you do any like sort of blocking at all I mean all of this stuff really comes down to like you know before the process really begins when we're finding people and chatting with people and trying to figure out you know who can sustain maybe a feature length length right uh, of a film i'm looking for people i can be honest with about how i feel about their lives what i think you know they, they tell me things and i sort of give you know what i you know my, my opinions about what i think a movie could be about them in that conversation which you know is is you know sometimes very uncomfortable it, it just it, it kicks off a whole process right so with each person i'm telling them this is what i'm interested in this is why i'd like to follow you i don't know where this is going to go, and I'm sure you don't know either, but it's going to take probably a few years uh, for the both of us to figure this out. And then from there, I think a lot of things just kind of start happening. When I shoot something, a lot of times I, I, you know, I know exactly what someone's routine is, or I know what their desires are, or their hopes, or their dreams, their fears. Uh, a lot of these things I, I hear from them when I do, you know, interviews. And after I hear those things, I talk with Dan, I talk with David, who's their cinematographer. I talk with our producers. I, I figure out ways to bring those things out into life. So let's say it's like someone is having a conversation about wanting to set a boundary in a relationship. I know that they want to have that conversation. And I don't tell them that I want them to have that conversation, but I'll put the camera down very close to them and kind of walk away. And I set up a very intentional frame and I just sort of let life play out in those intentional frames. Um, but then there's other stuff in the movie too, which I think really came about from, you know, the, the collaboration I have with Dan, but then that also extends to the cinema, you know, the, the, the subjects in the film. You know, there's sequences like people reading out their Facebook message exchanges and voiceover and these very uh, specific setups that, you know, are, try to bring to life what was going on when they were sending those messages. And for those, a lot of it is like, I, I, I really try as much as I can to invite the people who are in the movie into the process. Because to me, as a filmmaker, I want to do something where, you know, I'm not just trying to observe reality. I want to inhabit the emotional realities that everyone lives in. I want to to, to inhabit the subjectivity, the, the inner lives of the people in the movie. And so I, I'd send, you know, Steve, for example, I sent him the transcendental uh, cinema book written by Paul Schrader. He read it all. We we watched a lot of those movies together. You know, I watched Patterson with him and Rachel. I uh, showed <laughs> them scenes from that. I, I I basically gave them the you know this is how I'm I'm thinking that this could sort of exchange could play out. If you trust me and you you like this idea, let's do this. If you don't, then we can figure out another way to bring this idea to life. You know, but I shoot a lot of things. And I don't know where it's going to go, and that's where Dan comes in. And I really consider him like the co-author of all the films we make because he's 
you know, uh, there's a lot of seams. There's a lot of moments where the camera is adjusting. There's a lot of moments where things just are, are, are not shaped. Uh, and there's just too many ideas that, that we're swimming through. And that's where Dan kind of comes together and almost takes this narrative filmic approach, film editing approach to, to you know, documentary material. But Dan? I think one of the things that appeals to me so much about working with Lance is also just that, um, you know, I love cutting fiction films. I think that a lot of documentarians think of fiction film as kind of the ideal. Like you're shooting a bunch of verite material in hopes of yielding something that feels like it's a movie. And there's a lot of shaping that inevitably happens in the edit to get there. Um, one thing that I noticed, though, in the footage that Lance shoots is that although it feels very planned and in some cases artificial, I think it is no more so than the kind of material that you typically get in a Verite doc, in part because the minute that you introduce one of these big cameras into a space with real people who are just living their lives, the way that they present themselves to the camera always changes. And unless you're there 24 seven, and they just become completely used to you. Realistically, you're just not going to caption, capture certain important moments in their lives. And so you always have to find other ways of kind of approximating representations of those events. And so I think that the way that Lance approaches things in collaboration with his subjects, it's one way around that problem, where people know exactly how they're being represented, what kinds of things are interesting to the filmmakers. And so in a sense, there is a performance. It's as if they are actors in their own lives. And they're very aware of that. But that's just something that I think a lot of contemporary verite documentaries pretend doesn't exist, even though that's sort of the baseline. And it's often excused by these <laughs> aesthetics of like the shaky handheld camera, a very objective and neutral seeming grade, and all those kinds of trappings of verite doc, I think are just ways of, um, of trying to elide the filmmaker's hand in a way. Or I guess rather to to show the filmmaker's hand in a sort of calculated way, maybe, is a better way of putting it. And I think that Lance is actually showing his hand in a way that is actually quite overt. And in that sense, I think it's even more honest. But yeah, the editing process, I think, on these films is very much like a lot of docs in that people are very repetitive in conversations. There are always a lot of different topics that any conversation covers. And so there could be like five different scenes that cover the exact same story beat. And so the question is, which of these scenes best serves the purposes of the film? And there are just so many different options, you know, like you could have one dialogue scene that covers three topics, and you need to hit two of those topics. But you also have four other scenes that cover the same topics, which mm -hmm. two do you pick? What order do they go in? Um, and so there's a lot of conversation and back and forth between what's happening on set and what's happening in the edit. There's always this very fluid relationship where the editing and the writing are essentially occurring at the same time. This and Some Kind of Heaven are both, I'm pretty sure, like a tight 80 minutes or in the 80 minute range. <laughs> and it's like amazing to me how much you're able to condense, like just to the like kind of the bare essentials, but it's not too like constrained. Like you still get a really full realized picture. Like what does the full cut look like before you pare it down to that? Is that like an intentional choice to keep it pretty brief? I think we kind of just obey whatever the footage wants us to do. And okay. for some sort of strange reason, I feel like a lot of documentaries feel long when they're over like 90 minutes. I mm -hmm. feel like for some reason, like the 76 to 78 minute range is like God level documentary filmmaking to me. <laughs> like that's, <laughs> yeah. that's like the ideal documentary length. I, I don't know why that is exactly. But just in my experience, I feel like that's like around 80 minutes is probably a good place to be. Um, in right. part because I think real life stories don't necessarily have as many twists and turns as you would experience in, in a fiction film where you can literally script everything out right and then i think a lot of the time when people have much longer films it's just often due to like a lack of discipline about either excluding things that aren't interesting or overly expository or like dwelling too long in certain moments so i think we just try to be pretty disciplined and that just okay. by chance lands us somewhere around that duration yeah i also find just generally I, on my own attention span i i, I span i have I, I don't know if i have adhd or or something uh, or if i just drink too much coffee but i i generally just like i need to when i'm watching a movie i just want want to be totally immersed in the experience of it. I want to be escape into the lives of the people, you know, who are on on screen. And so I think part part of what we're trying to do is in some ways probably no different than a fiction film and the way those are constructed in the edit. You know, we're trying to just make and use every cinematic tool at our arsenal, you know, in, in our arsenal to 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 just totally break down the barriers of of where the screen starts and where your life you know your life ends we want we want it to just be a, a complete total immersive experience you know it's like emotional imax or something if we if we can and i feel like that's like uh you know short shorter uh, is better 
I yeah, think sort of a similar note you brought up IMAX I'm wondering how you shot uh <laughs> some of those like abstract or microscopic sperm shots I joked to my friend I was like this is like Oppenheimer but with like sperm it's like <laughs> just crazy little shapes and colors I thought it looked amazing but no we worked with an amazing um I, so there was a, a guy who I was a huge fan of he did the all of the his name is Chris Parks he did all of the uh kind of like macro fluid fluid effects in that in the in the fountain uh -huh. which to me is like outside of having worked with Darren it's like that and Vanilla Sky those are like my two uh <laughs> you know go-to movies if I just feel uh you know sad uh sometimes it just takes me back to being in like middle school and loving movies so anyway I remember when I was in middle school I was just like how did they do that and I, I remember reading an interview with with Chris Parks who used to work with his father and they did the tree of life and they they've done so many amazing films together and pretty early in the process probably you know maybe too early I don't know I reached out to Chris just being like look I'm trying to I don't know how this is going to work necessarily but I really want just like we're inhabiting the subjectivity hopefully of the people in the film you know I want to inhabit the subjectivity of the sperm it doesn't have to be scientific you know it could be very expressive but I just want to look at this stuff and I want it to feel dissimilar from how you see you know educational documentaries like I want it to feel fast and exciting and kind of provide a counterpoint to some of the more mundane, you know, handoffs that are, you know, in the movie, it's like, you know, a person, you know, watches porn, they masturbate. And it's like, there's nothing more, you know, kind of quotidian or something about that. Yeah, when you see what's going on, uh, you know, up close, it's, it's magical, it's like awe inspiring. And so that was sort of the, 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 the chase was like, how do we do this? And Chris just, yeah, he gave us a lot of material, a lot of back and forth between the, you know, it felt like giving like, you know, Dan, Dan was is much more articulate than I am. But you know, so providing notes was very difficult, because it felt like poetry or something you we were trying to <laughs> describe a sh specific shade of color yeah. and the this sort of defies capacity. description in a way yeah it's so yeah. subjective um right the whole time we would be we would be going back and forth about like which shot do we use here and there were times when lance was shooting and so we weren't actually in the room together but i would be sending him cuts of scenes and i would put in some of the chris parks material and lance would look at it and be like I don't know that this one is quite right. I feel like we should do one of these. And then I'll cut them in and be like, ah, that doesn't really make sense to me either. Because like this one suggests a miscarriage or this seems to imply that the sperm is traveling in this way. It's so abstract that anyone can draw <laughs> any sort of interpretation of it. But what's miraculous is that I think as we've gotten a chance to actually show it to audiences, people have kind of generally grasped what we wanted to suggest with these abstract images. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess that just means that we... And we fretted about it for long enough that we arrived at something that kind of worked. On that note, I think the music in the film kind of matches that tone perfectly. It was kind of matching what you were saying about the immersiveness. It's so dreamy. And I don't really have a question about it. I just think it sounds <laughs> amazing. Even the you, the yeah. trailer music. Um, I, I have that song in a playlist. I forget what it's called, but I like it. Oh, yeah. Energy kind of Flow. Yeah. yeah. Jumps out of my seat a bit. No, I mean, Ari, that's another person that like, it's like this, it's like the first or second call after Dan is on board. It, it, I, I go to Ari, he gets involved like very, 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 very early in stuff too. And a lot of it on this one was really interesting because it was like, what is, I know it's, it's such a silly, uh, I, I wish there was a, a better way to say it, but it's like, what is the sound of the sperm? You know, like what is the, uh, <laughs> you know, like it needs to be fast. So we're like, okay, it's percussive. But it shouldn't sound like real drums. It needs to sound like something um, maybe more like alien or something. And so we we found this drum machine that the um, that band Suicide, you know, that mm -hmm. does that Dream Baby Dream song uh, used. And it's like kind of throughout the movie. But yeah, I mean, that's sort of like the, you know, like the whole theme of the movie in, in a way, like it became clearer while working on the music for, for me, at least, which is sort of this like, you know, the movie starts off in a pretty transaction like these these interactions between two strangers you know there starts off very transactional and sort of impersonal and there's not that much uh you know even though people are literally meeting up to create life it's like there is very little emotion and very little humanity that's really in some of those early uh interactions and as the movie progresses it's like life finds a way and you know comp you know these relationships that you see they start to get more entangled the more humanity starts to seep through it so it, it that was sort of the feeling like musically how do we kind of create that experience that something that feels very foreign and and um yeah alien that kind of then 
crosses over again, even if it's the same instrumentation, melodically, it becomes more, yeah, it becomes more emotional, becomes more uh, human. I was going to say this feels like uh, sort of an expansion of what you're doing on some kind of heaven, which first of all, it's so, I mean, sick that you have such an established style and vision that uh, like this early on, it's like two features deep. I know clearly like how your movies work. And I think this pushes it even further. I watched this with a friend and we both had like very mixed because he we both love some kind of heaven and we are kind of comparing it. And he was saying that this one just feels a lot colder, um, a lot more, <laughs> I don't know, cynical in a way like it just the ending of it makes you feel kind of uneasy and weirdly some kind of heaven kind of has a something uplifting about it. Uh, well, I have two questions. If that was intentional, like if you went into this kind of like if you wanted to move more in that direction tonally and two, like if there was anything from some kind of heaven that you that you thought not didn't work, but that you wanted to expand on or, or push push in deeper, like is there anything from that film that you took into this one? Well, yeah, I mean, I, th I think it's sort of like each each movie asks for a different approach right in each each world and the people in it even though even even if there are sort of similar thematic ideas right because i think in some kind of heaven it's sort it's sort of like in both movies you're dealing with communities or settings groups of people that um seem a little bit like unorthodox right the the idea of a retirement community that's like fashion took like the 1950s or in this it's like these Facebook groups, but then, you know, you look a little deeper into it and you see that there are people that are just like yearning and longing and searching for, you know, human connection and, you know, very lonely worlds. And so I think with some kind of heaven, it was more like, okay, well, let's inhabit the sort of, like, it was important to mimic the setting, which was the, um, uh, the, the, you know, the manicured construction of, of everything. And I think that, that led, that lent, lent a create, you know, lent us a lot to play with. With this, I, it was sort of like, how do we do the same? You know, how do we, how do, but obviously we have to adapt what we're doing aesthetically, musically, editorially, you know, cinematically, everything needs to shift. And and I, I, I feel like part of it is capturing the, yeah, maybe the coldness of, of, of online connection that kind of leaves you feeling um, not uneasy, but sort of empty after you, you, you engage with someone there for too long, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but then also hopefully there's, there's warmth. In, like deep inside the the you know it's a very blue movie but there's there's warmth that can be found in in these relationships mm -hmm. by the end and i think even with the ending to me it's like i, I mean every time i've shown the movie to someone it's it, it prompts such a different reaction like i showed it to one person who was like this is extremely depressing and then i showed it to someone else who was like this was the most uplifting movie uh i've seen all year and so i i can't really tell i mean i can i can only tell you what we felt when we were making it and i feel like we wanted to end it on a um yeah end it on an image that that kind of recontextualizes sort of this the the, the childhood that the stories that we tell ourselves when we're young about how to, how we create families or what families even mean you know at the end where you see this this uh yeah this this bird that's dropping off children it's sort of you know it's not quite a fable there's not really a, a moral at the end of our story but but we are sort of showing that there are you know these are people that are li living their lives by that code by the idea that ev even though they're pursuing having families and very different ways than maybe other people are. They're still holding themselves to the standard that maybe most of us uh, do. You know that these 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 stories that are so ingrained in our lives. I feel like it's a hopeful movie ultimately, and um, I think it's a chill chillier film maybe in some respects just because of the uh, you know the, the the lives of the people we're following, but um in the darkness. But uh, I think if you look a little closer, there's, yeah, there, there's life, you know, life finds a way. Well, know? I think that there's also something structurally about the film that I think maybe makes it feel a little bit chillier or more depressing in some ways. I think part of it is that, you know, the beginning of the film shows exactly what it looks like if things go exactly according to plan. Anika, who's the woman at the very beginning of the film, succeeds, she has a baby, she's very happy, life goes on for her. But I think the rest of the movie shows you know, what happens when you don't just succeed right off the bat. I mean, the donors who sort of persist in this space are kind of kept in neutral, I think, for a lot of the time. I mean, their lives don't fundamentally change no matter how many times they donate. And the recipients who are trying to conceive and are not succeeding, um, I think, inevitably grow pretty frustrated. And those are the stories I think that are more interesting to us that can kind of sustain the narrative over the duration of the film, rather than just having a series of, you know, successes where like one after another, people are like, great, got the baby, see you later. Right. Um, and so in that sense, I think what makes for a good story is inherently a little bit less 
cheery. Yeah, you know, and you're watching, I mean, it's an uncomfortable film. I mean, it's like the movies that we were most drawn to while watching this, you know, they're not, I would say, like crowd pleasers. Like, you know, I love Bringing Out the Dead, you know, which is sort of, it felt like a kind of movie about how much do you give of yourself? It's like, you know, well, you know, you're start sacrificing parts of your life in order to save people's lives. So I felt like there was some kind of connection between that and the donors, you know, Broken Flowers, salesmen you know these mm -hmm. were all it's like you know and, and then and then just sort of the other things we were observing it's like people the thing i felt when i the thing that made me want to make the movie to begin with was that i was scrolling on the the facebook groups and i just i saw that like behind each post was probably a, like a novel's worth of a movie and yet there was such like it was almost kind of weirdly comedic sometimes to see someone post their entire life story and then someone comment I'm available like two words <laughs> like underneath it you know but the other but the thing I saw between the two things but you know and, and, and you know was was that everyone was searching this that everyone wanted to be seen they wanted to be seen as like valuable or yeah you know worthy of replication in some way and you know that those are uncomfortable things maybe to think about but you know I'm interested in having children some some people that are involved in the movie are not and I think that's maybe that's another part of it too is that it's not the most uh, rosy depiction of starting families or anything <laughs> like that yeah has anyone is the Facebook group I'm assuming you know they're aware of the film and like the release of it I mean I'm so tempted to like try and track it down I haven't like tried searching for it but I like kind of want to see what, what's going on in there right now I mean in general like how do the subjects feel about it I, I mean I know you probably get asked this a lot but no no well, I mean you know we're this hey we're early in the, the press <laughs> so we're, we haven't really been I'm... talking about it that much but no we I, I showed that everyone the movie before it premiered uh, at a festival at True False I was nervous uh you know you never know how people are going to feel and, and for me if if it felt like what we were doing um was wrong or if it felt like they didn't like the depiction of it, mm -hmm. I would have felt like a failure on many levels. It would have felt like a failure of the film because I'm trying so desperately to inhabit the lives and the the subjectivity of their experiences musically, you know, everything we're doing. And I would have just felt like, you know, well, you know, what's the point if they're not going to, if they don't feel seen by something, then why, why even make it? Anyway, all of which to say is they all, I want, you know, we went each state to state, house to house. I showed everyone the movie and everyone really loved it. You know, Steve and Rachel watched it together. Rachel watched it twice, actually. And uh, we watched it with Steve in, in the very uh, living room where they watched uh, the movies that they watched together, which was kind of special. You know, Ari brought his nieces, you know, his brother, which was an interesting experience. Uh, he was just laughing the whole time. Tyree and Natasha, <laughs> uh, they couldn't stop laughing for most of the movie. So, you know, I don't know that th this I can't tell if maybe part of it is because every setup, every scene, every moment requires this degree of like uh, conversation. I need to be upfront about what I'm hoping to capture. And I don't ever tell people do that, like, you know, say this or I'm not giving people scripts or anything like that. But I'm always honest about, you know, well, this just happened in your life and I want to find a way to capture that. So let's figure it out. Let's figure out a way we can do that creatively. Um, and I think through that process, you know, maybe they feel like there's more ownership in the depiction. Like there's nothing in the movie that really surprised them that 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 uh, is is in it. Right. Yeah. In terms of the groups, I mean, it's interesting. I, I I'm not sure how aware everyone is. I, I you know, I'm, I'm I'm only in like a few of them right now, and I think people hopefully will embrace it there. But I also, you know, I feel like people are in the groups really. They're they're on their own quests. The women are there to have children. You know, that the, the all the all the hopeful parents are there to do that. If they don't, they leave. They're really the, the only mainstays, like Dan was saying, in the groups are the men. And so I, I have a feeling that probably the people who, um, you know, the more active participants of the groups, they're the, they're the donors. I'm sure they'll have, uh, you know, strong feelings about the movie either way. Could you talk a little bit about the, the graphics for each city? Um, I thought that was such an amazing little detail because I, I get so annoyed sometimes when I'm watching a movie and it's like clearly just like Helvetica or like, <laughs> it's just the most basic <laughs> default text. And well, even that was like a small detail that you guys like just made something out of. And I thought it was, could you talk a little bit about, I don't know, the thoughts behind that? I mean, the great Teddy Blanks. 
who is is kind of like one of the uh, go to title designers, I think, for a lot of filmmakers. Um, I mean, he did like Barbie, for instance, but he's also done so many different indie films. And um, he's just an incredibly talented designer. But this is kind of what happens when uh, when you ask your, your title designer to go wild and just, you know, design things to his heart's content. One of the main reference points for him, I think, was um, medicines and um, like pharmaceutical advertising, fertility products, and seeing how the logos for those products were designed. He was sort of drawing in a lot of those sorts of inspirations to to make all of these different location IDs. And um, whether or not people are actually consciously aware of that while they're watching the film. I mean, obviously, it's like it's such an incredible range and a colorful set of um, of graphics. But whether or not people immediately associate that with medical advertising, you know, I, I don't know. But I think the concept is really strong. And at the, at the very least, I think that even though they're each so distinct, they really feel like they are of a piece in a yeah. way, just because just because of that unified set of influences that Teddy's referring to. But yeah, I mean, he's just he's the best. And yeah. it yeah. was a pleasure to get to work with him. He also nice. did the uh, he he came up with the the main, you know, sperm world type where yeah. uh, the O filled out, you know, I mean, yeah, he's he's I mean, that's like the one of the beauty, the, the, the beauties of also making this film and uh, Ren Faire, you know, at the same time, it's like everyone that worked on, you know, either project like Dan is involved in Ren Faire, Max, who cut Ren Faire is involved in sperm, like, you know, Teddy did the titles for both. Ari did the music for both. It's like this kind of um, this nucleus uh, where we all were just, uh, you know, throwing everything that we possibly could at both projects. And when you work with extremely talented people, I mean, I'm like, you know, uh, it's it's I, like the movies would be nothing if Dan weren't cutting them. Right. It wouldn't be like it would just would be uh, whatever style that that uh, I feel like we've all been honing in on is something that is done all together. I couldn't do it uh, alone. And, you know, it's a lot of trial and error. But the locations were, were something that, Dan, I mean, that was something that you were pushing for early on. I was more skeptical if we needed it. Uh, but I, I came around to it and I, I you know, it's, it's obvious that the movie needs it because I think, um, yeah, in a way, it's sort of you look you look at the locations and, and I don't know that something about the way like American architecture works these days and strip malls and like suburban houses and all that stuff. They all it all kind of blends together. Mm -hmm. It all looks the same. It all looks extremely sort of anonymized and everything looks the same. And so we were maybe trying to initially I was like, well, I love that movie Chain by Jem Cohen. And, you know, I love that they don't do that in that movie. And at the end, they review it. But that's a structuralist sort of art film. And this is something where we're not, you know, I'm not trying to make a big deal out of Mm -hmm. uh, how homogenized stuff looks. So I think in a way it, it helped show some scope of, uh, you know, where these stories were happening. It's not just one state, one city. It's It provides some degree of context that this is happening really across the country. The biggest thing, not to, you know, go on and on about this type of stuff, but that's another thing. It's sort of like, how can you make a movie? You know, for us, it's like, we don't want to do a movie where, we, where we're, it feels like an educational or informational film, you know, I'm much more interested in, as I've said it already, you know, emotions and dramatic scenes and how, what, what one person wants, you know, wants and obstacles, you know, what one person wants is different than what another person wants. And so with this, it's like how, and that took a lot of trial and error too. How can we make something that, um, where we basically give you the least amount of context possible and make you feel like you're in the room with, these people, you know, that are basically that don't know each other at all, that are, um, you know, trying to endear themselves to one another as quickly as possible just to get this product, you know, to get this, this, you know, the, the, the donation. And so that was another thing, just a lot of trial and error there. But we discovered through the graphics that, you know, not just the location IDs, but also the Facebook posts throughout the movie that like, it gave you just enough to feel like you were seeing a life beyond the lives that you that you were you know that were observing in the film. I want to start wrapping things up here, but before we head out, I kind of just wanted to ask if you guys have been watching anything good recently. Um, if you have any recommendations, uh, similar to this film or like based on the film, any inspirations, like just any 
shout outs you have well i i, I finally got around to watching uh I, i've been on like uh i watched the yards the james gray movie for the first time you yeah. know absolutely not, nothing to do with this movie but that's just one of those that's like uh if you haven't seen it you should drop everything i've you know two lovers is like one of my favorite movies uh ever and it's it's certainly i think his greatest film just it's a masterpiece but i think the yards comes close to it for this movie i i mean yeah salesman broken flowers uh, bringing out the dead chain the Jem cohen movie you know we were looking at some road movies so i'd throw like paris texas in there you know and then some of the other stuff we were looking at jake longstreth who's a painter you know he's he's just absolutely amazing landscapes that are all about sort of the you know natural environment that's you know being uh encroached by like walmarts and arby's and hooters <laughs> and uh nick dernasso who did the poster for the film you know i think that he was another big source of inspiration for us he he wrote um he's a graphic novelist he he created um acting class and uh sabrina amazing uh, comics, if if people like that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, all of those Maybe influences for sure. I got to see Paris, Texas on a big screen for the first time like a couple of weeks ago. That was a magical experience. Yeah, I think for me, honestly, Patterson was the movie that really unlocked things mm. for me on just level of editing, thinking about how to, how to construct people's daily lives. And then also a lot of the way that um, the way that they use cross dissolves too, I think is something that uh, really appealed to me in Patterson and that we ended up using a fair bit in, uh, in sperm yeah. world. I I'm assuming you guys have seen perfect days. Uh, oh yeah. Now. That's, I still have to. It's so great. Yeah. But anyway, thank you guys so much for being here. Thank really you. appreciate it. Uh, um, thanks for having us. Please check out. I don't know when I'll, I'll probably put this up closer to when the film comes out. But uh, nice. check out Sperm World. What's the date again? What's the specific date? Uh, it's coming out on the 29th on FX and it's uh, next day. So the 30th on Hulu. Perfect. So perfect. Watch it there. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you guys so much for being here. Yeah. Thank you, man. Thanks. This is great.